give it up for Seth Andrews, y'all. That's awesome. That's awesome. Nice to see everybody. Can you hear me okay in the back? I came out of, uh, I live in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I don't know about you, but it's nice to get together for at least one hour where we don't have to endure existential dread. Anybody else going through that right now? <laughs> you wake up in the morning, you log on to the world, damage report, oh God, so. Um, but it means a lot that you would chew into a Saturday night Somebody called it date night, and I was like, oh my God, set your bar a little higher for date night. <laughs> but uh, that, uh, that, you would, that you would come here and be a part of it, it means the world to me. It's, it's a way for me to connect. You know, I spent a lot of time in Red State, Jesus Town, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And, and uh, do any of you ever end up in an event where, or a, a family gathering, and you, even when they don't say it, you can feel it sort of dripping off of them, like, we just need to pray for them and show them the love of Jesus kind of thing. Anybody else go through that? And to be in a room where nobody's doing that to me, it's like, oh, s sweet nectar, sweet oxygen, you know, thank you. Um, River had mentioned true stories. Rather than just do a 45 minute thing, if you guys have an extra five minutes, I'm gonna try this out on you because I know, any, anybody here heard of my second show? I'm just gonna throw this out because I think it'd be fun. Um, I'm gonna do one for you live real fast and see what the response is. Now I'm doing this off the cuff from memory, so I'm gonna, if I get a year wrong, um, bear with me. And so I'm gonna do that and then I'm gonna take a huge right turn or left turn and, and start the event. Are you ready? <laughs> Okay, John was a code breaker for the United States Air Force. The year was 1953. This was eight years after the ending of the Second World War, but it was right when the Cold War was kicking into high gear. Of course, we're talking about the world's major superpowers, the Soviet Union and the United States. And John was a code breaker, and his job was to sit, intercept Russian transmissions, secret messages, decode them and then pass those messages up the chain of command. And one day, and I think it was March of 1953, there was a lot of chatter. And it was about Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin is in failing health. And of course, Joseph Stalin had been the dictator of Russia for like 20 years. He ruled with an iron fist. Historians say he was responsible for maybe 20 million deaths in his own country. And what happened to Stalin would affect politics on the world stage. And this was information Russia wanted closely managed. So all these transmissions were hidden and secret. But there was John. And he was listening and translating. Joseph Stalin is increasingly ill. Doctors have been summoned. It doesn't look good. Until finally, the message came in, Joseph Stalin has died. John gave that message to his supervisor, who passed it up the chain of command until it shortly afterward reached the president's ear. President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Now, what's interesting about this story is not Stalin. It's John. Because the man whose message would go up the chain to meet the ear of a president, that man would in his life and career go on to shake hands with several presidents. You see, John was in his off hours an artist, a musician. And after his honorable discharge, he started making albums, writing songs, doing concerts before hundreds, thousands, and then tens of thousands of people. He would go on in his life to be inducted into both the rock and roll and the country music hall of fame. The John that sat in that code breaker's chair was the same John who walked the line who went down to that burning ring of fire and sang the Folsom Prison Blues, Johnny Cash. Did you enjoy that? Was that fun? Yeah. 
it's a nice distraction, you know, from some of the other, because you do the heavy stuff all the time. And, you know, talk about existential. Sometimes I finish the, the broadcast week and I just go back and, you know, Natalie's like, she, she's my Tony Robbins. You can do it. Come on, <laughs> stick with me. Okay. You guys ready to have some fun and learn some stuff? Okay. From long ago, near the literal dawn of planet Earth, the creator made man according to his perfect will in his image. And since that day, men have long gazed upward toward the heavens and said, designer, why in the world did you put my testicles there? <laughs> why? Why? Honestly, this is just one of the many problems that I have about the intelligent design of my body and of the living and the non-living world. And I'm going to come back to this specific design flaw between our legs here in just a second, okay? Okay. The Bible and its defenders keep telling me, I am molded by the hand of the potter. But now, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are our potter. And all of us are the work of your hand. It's lovely when you read it out of Isaiah. I'm the work of his hand. I mean, it makes me feel really special. Intelligently designed. Now, the ID claim is this, that you and I and everything around us were too complex and optimized and wonderful to have evolved by natural selection. Everything has been drawn previously in blueprint by a cosmic architect, according to experts from places like the Discovery Institute. What a wonderful name. Who doesn't want to discover stuff, right? <laughs> Well, if you don't know who these people are, and most of you are probably on to me, the Discovery Institute is not a science lab. It's not a legitimate research organization. This is a politically conservative nonprofit think tank based out of Seattle. They're the ones who, they realized creationism in schools wasn't flying, so they started the whole ID, intelligent design. Teach the controversy and let the children decide. You know, kind of like, let's teach flat earth against spherical earth and let the children decide. It's kind of that thing. And they stack their staff and their leadership and their spokesperson, um, their board or whatever, with fancy PhD types, actual PhDs with various degrees in science, philosophy, etc. Like this guy, Dr. Michael Behe. He's a biochemist. He's a senior fellow at the Discovery Institute. And he says that the human eye is masterfully made and it must have been designed. Strangely, Dr. Behe wears scientifically developed <laughs> lenses for vision correction <laughs> and does not see the irony. Okay, but his thing is this. His thing is that the eye is irreducibly complex. The irreducibly complex model works like this. The system has a whole lot of distinct parts, and I'm using the car engine diagram here. And these parts are necessary for it to work at all, or at least work properly. If you remove a single part, it no longer works the way it should. All right? And B, he says the same thing about the human eye. Every part is properly placed. If anything is removed or omitted, it either breaks down, doesn't work at all. All right, irreducible complexity. Dr. Stephen Meyer, he's another irreducible complexity guy. He's a philosopher of history. He's also a senior fellow at the Discovery Institute. He's got several books, including this one, called Signature in the Cell, DNA and the Evidence for Intelligent Design. He has mentioned, more specifically, a theistic source. I wonder which god he's talking about. <laughs> like me, uh, Dr. Behe, uh, Stephen Meyer's a Christian. He does have a specific designer in mind, as he recently and helpfully pointed out in July of last year on the Joe Rogan Show. Of course, Rogan is always a reliable forum for rich scientific discussions, isn't he? <laughs> Anybody else see Rogan talking to these guys with zero pushback and just want to crawl through the screen and grab that guy by the shoulders? I mean, dear Lord. Anyway, Stephen Meyer. Stephen Meyer says that the wondrous coding of our DNA proves design. 
This is William Dembski. He is a mathematician and philosopher, senior fellow at the Discovery Institute's Design irreducible complexity and again he's wearing the glasses because he needs vision correction on his perfectly designed eyes okay and and let's jump out of the discovery institute for just a second let's play one of the classics oh yeah ken ham yeah ken ham is actually irritated at the discovery institute and the reason he's mad is because they're talking about a designer ken ham's like you cowards, you need to be saying instead of first cause, you need to be saying Yahweh Jesus, the God of the Bible. The credit should go where it belongs, the perfect creator of perfect creation. And Ken Ham has glasses. Okay. Okay, he's got glasses. So here we are. We, we gaze into the beautiful eyes of a newborn baby and we see the master blueprint right in front of us. Psalm 139, 14, for you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You're designed. But if that baby could understand what we were saying and we told him the details of his design and the problems that they were going to cause him in his lifetime, I suspect he would, <laughs> <laughs> he, he would like a word with somebody, right? What in the actual hell? I have a complaint. Where's my comment card? Okay. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Abby Hafer is a zoologist and a human anatomy professor. I've had her on the show a few times over the past 10 years. And, and she wrote a book called The Not-So-Intelligent Designer. Why Evolution Explains the Human Body and Intelligent Design Does Not. And um, I noticed she didn't have an audiobook version of it, and I've never done this before. I reached out and I said, hey, Dr. Hafer, I'm a fan. I, I just love this book. I love the angle you've taken. If you ever wanted a narrator, you don't need me. You're a science communicator, but if you ever wanted to collaborate, I'd be honored to narrate your audiobook. And she was like, I'm all over that. So we worked together uh, over the course of a few months, kind of hammering things out, and I voiced the audible.com version of this, which came out earlier this year. And, but as I was uh, involved with the book, I'd, I'd read it the first time, I thought, wow, these are really, really good points. And she's got some interesting observations. I'm standing on her shoulders and the shoulders of other uh, vetted, uh, peer-reviewed scientists, and I've added some of my own stuff in here, but understand I'm not a great mind, I'm not a PhD scientist, I'm simply relying on the expertise of those who are. Dr. Haper has some interesting observations about the design of the human eye. Let's take a look at this diagram. Light comes in, do I have my little laser? No. Light comes in through the lens on the front and it travels backward to the photoreceptors at the uh, end of the eye, at the, at the back area. Let's take a close-up look at this back membrane. Ah, too bad. Um, the carrot-shaped objects right there at the back, those are the cones. They are the photoreceptors that receive color. And the rods, those are the photoreceptors that perceive black and white. Now check out what's in front of them. We have several layers of other cells that do not see. They are blocking some of the light needed by the photoreceptors. But wait, you see this yellow layer? Those are nerve fibers. They don't respond to light. They sit on top of the cells that sit on top of the photoreceptors. On top of them is a series of blood vessels. They sit on top of the fibers which sit on top of the cells which sit on top of the photoreceptors. Where the vessels and nerve fibers converge, this is known as the optic disc. This creates a literal blind spot in our vision. In fact, here's an actual image of the eye where you can see the vessels converging right there. This is the blind spot. And our brains have to compensate for this. Now, Dr. Hafer in her book actually has an exercise that you can use to see your own blind spot. It really doesn't work on the big screen. You can Google Dr. Abby Hafer uh, blind spot and the test will pop up. It's, it's pretty rudimentary. It's just this. Okay, I'll show you what it is. You will hold this image about 18 inches in front of your face. 
you close your left eye and you focus X directly in front of your right eye and then you move the image toward your face. That O will disappear and you will see or not see because of your blind spot. Do you know which creatures don't have this blind spot? A great many. How about this guy, the octopus? The octopus, like other cephalopods, they see better than we do. They see better in dimmer light. They recognize polarized light. And oh, looky, the blood vessels and the nerve fibers and the helper cells are behind the photoreceptors. Their brains don't have to compensate. Their brains don't have to decode and fill blanks because stuff's blocking the image. Why did we not get this deal? Why would a designer put the camera wiring between the lens and the imaging chip? <laughs> Doesn't make any design sense whatsoever. Beyond that, geckos, they've got fantastic night vision, 350 times more sensitive to color than you and I are. Eagles can see the ultraviolet spectrum with amazing focus and distance vision of up to two miles. Imagine how handy that would be in traffic. <laughs> Woo, right? Rubberneckers, accident, traffic jam. I'm going to take this exit. I wish we had that. How about this guy, the four-eyed fish? Actually, it's two eyes that are split, but this creature can see simultaneously below the surface of the water and above the water at the same time. Now, let's fantasize a little bit. Let's have some fun. Let's go beyond the observable. Let's talk about the possible, okay? Let's say I'm the designer. In my plan, the lenses of the eye would not lose flexibility to make us far-sighted or have refraction errors that make us nearsighted. I would include sensors for UV, maybe infrared. How about some macro and zoom lenses? You gotta see something up close. Anybody else at restaurants and you use the flashlight on your phone because you can't see the goddamn menu? <laughs> Macro lens totally solves that, right? <laughs> Zoom lens, you could go out, hyper focus. I would make our eyes immune to allergies. How bad is allergy season in Denver? Is it bad? It's bad, yeah. Imagine if we didn't have to worry about allergies. Oh my goodness. I would give us a switch in case we wanted 360 degree vision. I wouldn't want that all the time, it'd freak me out. But, but like, have you ever heard someone say, boy, I wish I had eyes in the back of my head, right? Or I wish I had my head on a swivel. Well, we could turn that on. And if we had to deal with glaucoma and cataracts, some kind of degeneration, I would make our eyes modular and replaceable, like car parts. <laughs> Pop them out. I'll bet you can think of a bunch of other improvements I haven't even brought to the table today, right? No more glasses, no more contacts, no LASIK, no more allergy season, no more blindness. Can you even imagine? By the way, I just discovered this guy last year. There's a cancer survivor. His name is Brian Stanley. He's got a TikTok channel where he shows what he does. He lost an eye to cancer when he was four, okay? And I don't know, for 20 some years, he wore a standard prosthetic eye. Well, he became an engineer which manufactures aeronautic and medical parts. And he made his own adaptation. That is Brian Stanley, who made a titanium cyborg eye. <laughs> And he's got an arsenal of them. They all do a bunch of, he's got one that's a flashlight. There's a video. He turns the light off and he's like around his room. He's got neon orbs. He's got lasers that shoot out. I guess you can become your own cat toy. I don't know. <laughs> For the holidays, he's got an eye with a jack-o'-lantern, and, and he's got red and green colors for Christmas. I mean, it's wacky. Just Google Brian Stanley on TikTok. It's, it's remarkable, right? Well, that's not a bad adaptation. I might include that just for kicks. Roughly 85% of Americans have to get their wisdom teeth pulled because there's not enough room in our mouths. Here's a design idea. No wisdom teeth or a bigger mouth. 
And speaking of teeth, we're supposed to live our entire lives on one set of adult teeth. Baby teeth fall out when? Maybe when we're six? And then we're talking if we live a good long life, 70, 80 years, of dealing with food, bacteria, plaque, decay, cavities, chips, broken teeth, gum disease. This is bad design. This is bad design. All, one set of adult teeth for decades and decades and decades. If it was me, I would give human beings teeth like sharks. See? <laughs> This Photoshop job just always makes me laugh and I don't know why. Okay, okay. Sharks, sharks. The great white shark develops a new set of teeth about every two weeks. They just rotate them out twice a month. Endless supply of teeth. They don't have time to accumulate plaque. If you chip one, no problem. It's gone in a few days. This seems like better design. I mean, there'd be a way to like rotate them out so it doesn't happen over, you know, coffee or <laughs> something like that. But I mean, I would build that in, you know? Every night at 9.30, you just ding, and it goes differently. That seems like better design. Sharks and other ocean creatures have the ability to breathe underwater. Why don't we have that same ability? All right. We know it's possible. This is the African lungfish. It has gills for water, but it also has a modified swim bladder that acts like lungs when it's on the surface. It can breathe air. This improvement in human design could save 230,000 needless drowning deaths worldwide every year. Can you imagine somebody falls at the bottom of the pool or in a lake or in a riptide or whatever, and they could just breathe until they could get help? Imagine that. That seems pretty basic. Speaking of breathing, I would not put the food pipe and the wind pipe <laughs> in the same spot. Who came up with this shit? <laughs> and put a little flap to protect one from the other? What, what does this cost us in terms of human lives? There are over 5,000 choking deaths per year just in this country. 5,000 people. It's crazy. Here is a design complaint I have. Either give me hair or don't <laughs> give me hair. Like, what the hell? What is this shit right here? What is that? Right? What is that? This half ass, do nothing hair of inconvenience. And what do we do with it? We shave and we pluck and we wax and we laser. How much of our bodies? You know? And it makes sense if we are evolved higher primates, that one chromosome away from the chimpanzee. By the way, we have exactly the same number of hair follicles on our body as chimpanzees do. We have the same, I forgot how many million, two to five million hair follicles. It's just that over our course of evolution, as we have not needed hair for shelter and to ward off pre uh, predators, the hair has become much, much, much finer, so it's much more difficult to see. But we have the exact number of hair follicles that chimps do. But I'm not talking evolution now. I'm talking about design that makes no practical sense. I would do better, right? I'd make it so that our main source of light on this planet doesn't give us fucking cancer. <laughs> our sun, give, when someone goes out and they're like, look at the beautiful day that the Lord has made, and I'm like, UV rays are coming down on you. I just, it's about 700,000 people are diagnosed with skin related, uh, sun related skin cancer every year. 700,000 people. Our source of natural light harms us. We have to put on creams and sleeves to protect ourselves. I would build the sunblock right into the system. Maybe I'd even make it solar powered. Anyone ever wished that you didn't need sleep? Wouldn't that be nice? I mean, I love my sleep, but we've all been on a deadline or had to take a long road trip, and you're like, I just don't have time. I've really got to get this done. If we were solar powered literally all day, we just sort of tool up and then click the battery on, and you're set. I would make DNA so that genetic copy errors didn't produce mutations, cause cancer, Huntington's, ALS, hemophilia, other terrible genetic diseases. We just watched the documentary on... Um, was it on Amazon about Celine Dion? Have you guys seen that one? It's called I Am. It's heartbreaking. 
where she has some kind of an autoimmune disease which causes the muscles in her body to stiffen up and it has ruined her larynx. And so a woman who has only known music and singing is now at a point where if she is around music that moves her, it stimulates the brain and it causes her to go into monumentally agonizing seizures. Yeah, my design would remove those types of things from the design. The way we copy our genes moving on through the generations doesn't even work as well as a standard photocopier. It's amazing. The American College of Rheumatology reports there are 790,000 total knee replacement surgeries in this country every year. Anybody here gone through that? Yeah. My knees are starting to crack when I go upstairs, so I know one day may, may be coming. I, it makes sense evolutionarily that we only recently became bipeds. We used to be quadrupeds, and then now we've got larger hips. We have bigger skulls to accommodate larger brains. There's more weight. We know we're living longer, and so these things wear out. It makes sense if you look at us as higher primates, but I'm talking about design. Cartilage that grinds away Way too soon in our lives, a quarter of people in this country suffer from arthritis at some level. I'd make either longer lasting cartilage, I would maybe make our knees out of indestructible material, maybe I'd make it swappable or modular, right? We swap out other stuff all the time when we need to. Here's a fun one. I think I'd skip the appendix. <laughs> hey, I'm just curious, anybody here had to have their appendix out? Anybody? Quite a few. Um, the appendix is part of our human digestive system, which is weird because it doesn't really, it doesn't digest anything at all. It's an organ that has no function. It's a touch, attached to another blind sac that is called the cecum. Now, these are little greenhouses for bacteria. If we see the appendix through the lens of evolution, we see that these bacteria were designed to help animals digest wood. Rabbits, other creatures out there, some of them digest wood, but we do not. We have some of the tools, we have some of the mechanisms, but they do not work within our body. We simply have this vestigial, this evolutionary leftover, a tiny gathering of bacteria that lives in its own little house. And if sometimes the party gets a little bit out of hand, and then a colony of really nasty bacteria ramps up, we develop a lethal infection called appendicitis, and the appendix swells until it bursts. Now I'm going to show you an appendix being extracted, so if you're a little squeamish, don't want to see it, I'll tell you when it's safe to look back. Oh yeah. Who comes up with that? Why would you make that? Why would you include that? Why would you include a tiny hand grenade of doom in the body of your design children? And speaking of pain, I would give us a pain dial. A working pain sensitivity gauge. Have a minimum, a maximum, and a spectrum in between. Now what's the purpose of pain? Because pain does have a purpose. A couple of purposes, actually. It lets our brains know that we're hurt and how bad we're hurt. And to motivate us to try to avoid injury in the future. If, if injury hurts, we are much more inclined to not put ourselves in situations where we, we might get injury. Pain is both messenger and motivator. But once we feel the pain, right, once we experience that agonizing pain, what's the point? What's the point? You break a leg, you cut yourself on barbed wire, you're burned horribly in a fire. Once the pain says shit has gone down, what do we do? We get ourselves to someone who can mitigate the pain away. Why the middleman between us and our relief. And don't tell me that people who believe in an intelligent designer aren't on pain relievers. Don't tell me they don't want pain medications in the hospital, right? They would love this adaptation and it would not be the designer's idea. Why would we lock anybody into misery and screams and tears when they already know they're hurt? It doesn't make any sense. I would have the misery reduction device just built right into the machine. 
Maybe it activates after we get hurt. So it's still a deterrent, right? You feel it right off the bat and you have that moment and then you can switch it on. I don't know, something like that. Speaking of pain management, I know many of you can relate to this one. Anyone know about this little piece of heaven from firsthand experience? The epidural. An invasive pain regulator most commonly used for childbirth, administered from the outside because we don't have pain prevention inside, except for maybe a quick endorphin or adrenaline rush. Why do women need pain prevention in the delivery room? Because of the birthing blueprint. Someone explain how that <laughs> makes design sense by any measuring stick. Now, I'm going to make my point without being too graphic, but we're all adults here, okay? <laughs> After nine long months of pregnancy, let's deliver the baby's head through a circle of bone smaller than the baby's head. Both bodies are traumatized. You got vaginal tear. You may have nerve damage, muscle damage, damage to the pelvis floor, maybe injury or death to the baby, some kind of head trauma, dislocated limbs, bone fractures. It's very common. Almost 280,000 women die in childbirth every year on this planet. It's crazy. That's 800 a day. That's a death every two minutes. That's 90 people during the course of my speech. Now, that number has dropped in the United States, thanks to modern medicine, to about 1,200. But still, it's 1,200. In the age of modern medicine, and how about this potential side effect? And I learned about this in Dr. Hafer's book. For some women, the trauma of childbirth can cause something called fistula. The pressure of the baby's head cuts off blood flow to part of the vaginal wall. It just kind of squeezes the blood out of it. That tissue then dies and rots away and it leaves a hole. And the woman gets the joy of leaking urine or feces out of her body for the rest of her life. Oh yeah, I think you and I could do better. And we see better in nature. How about the kangaroo? Why didn't we get the same deal as the kangaroo? No, the kangaroo's awesome. It's awesome. Okay. From Dr. Hafer's book, animals like kangaroos give birth to very small, embryo-like young that are placed in a pocket on the outside of the mother's body. This is where they continue their development. So here we go. At about four weeks, the fetus is delivered by the mother kangaroo into the pouch. Four weeks. The fetus is about the size of a jelly bean. And the pouch already has a handy dandy nipple ready for feeding. When it grows to about six months, it can exit the pouch and then return to the pouch when it's ready. It can go in and out, come and go. Gate privileges, right? <laughs> Gate privileges. We could design this in people. No. We could do this for people. Right? You deliver the fetus out of your body into an external pouch when it's this big. The size of a, a pea or a jelly bean or whatever, right? There's no discomfort, there's no morning sickness, there's no labor pain, there's no screaming in the delivery room, there's no epidural, there's no Lamaze, no tearing, breaking, squeezing, injury, death. I would also make pregnancy possible for men because it's about damn time they share the load. <laughs> Quick note, by the way, for the anti-choice crowd. The divine blueprint for human reproduction has roughly half of all fertilized eggs not surviving to term. Many, many, many failed embryos are instead flushed out through menstruation even before many women know they are pregnant. Right? A fertilized egg, what many people would consider already a human soul or a baby, a full-grown baby. This would make the intelligent designer the most prolific abortion doctor in history. Also relating to the human reproductive process, who designed the plumbing, right? Why do we have the same canal for sex that we do for eliminating waste? 
who puts the sewer and the water slide on the same ride? Who does that? If I did not want men to have foreskins, I would not create them. With foreskin. Have, have you read the Old Testament? The whole freaking Old Testament is Yahweh going, you are wonderfully made. Slice that off immediately. <laughs> I would have our bodies expel excess calories the minute we hit our daily requirement. Wouldn't that be nice? Bring on the cheesecake, right? Bring on the diet brownie. <laughs> Bring on the diet brownie, baby. I'm going. It doesn't make any difference, right? Sugar wouldn't add pounds. It wouldn't cause diabetes. We think about all of the health problems that we might be able to avoid if our bodies were food processors instead of just uh, instead of just warehouses. I know they process, but you know what I'm talking about. I would make us all both right and left-handed. Why would a designer make it so we have one dominant hand that can do almost anything and the other one can barely hold a butter knife? <laughs> My le I can barely hold a butter knife with this hand. Someone explain this to me. I would design our brain so we aren't constantly forgetting things and this is becoming a problem. I'm 56 and man, I got, what was his, what was their name? Where did I park? What's my password? Right? Oh, your password cannot be the same as your previous password. Or it can't be the password you've used in the last 12 months. Oh, now you're locked out of your account. Now you gotta call the 800 number. What if that could be prevented? This is stupid. Pieces of information that I once knew that I can no longer remember. Remember, our home and our business computers have a comprehensive filing system for quick retrieval. Why not our brains? I need some info. Doesn't mean I have to know it, everything all at once. But I can just say, oh wait, I need to have that information which I knew 15 years ago. I go back by date, by, by subject matter, and I can pull it up for essentially a Google Drive inside my skull. We could run antivirus programs on our brains. So say goodbye to cognitive impairments, Alzheimer's, depression, whatever. That'd be amazing. I would give humans the ability to regenerate severed limbs. According to the National Institutes of Health, over 57 million people globally live with some kind of a limb amputation due to trauma. And then what happens? We have to go and get expensive replacements made out of plastic, silicone, titanium. This guy got a better deal. This is the axolotl. He's a large salamander, also known as the Mexican walking fish. He has the ability to regenerate his limbs and even his tail. And when he regrows the tail, that means he also regrows the spinal cord, the backbone, and all of the muscles. It's remarkable. Scientists are studying the axolotl in the hopes of di discovering what the genes are, what's going on, which might help us one day do the same as human beings. Well, I would build lead limb regeneration right into the design. Um, Here's one that just popped into my head when I was at a conference. I was at a uh, free thought convention. I was standing in a, an elevator at the hotel. I would make farts smell like croissants. <laughs> I mean, if you have to have farts, just give me something, right? Give me something, okay. Beyond our human bodies, there's so much design in this world, it makes no sense. And in my own work, I hear a lot of this kind of thing. Anybody heard, look at the trees? Anybody heard that one? <laughs> oh, look at this beautiful sunset and the cloud formations. And oh, it's obviously the work of a cosmic designer. It's so beautiful. Everything's in nature perfectly attuned to accommodate life. The birds and the fish and the insects and the clouds and the rain, this all must be the product of a painter's brush. But could you and I do better? I think so. Why would we build a system that collapses when a brick gets yanked out of the bottom? Because that's what happens every day all over planet Earth. Right, we've been talking about the wildfires in Mexico. It's crazy, the wildfires in California, the horrible wild, the history making wildfires in Australia. What was the body count in those? Horrifying. I would make sure our planet is not constantly trying to kill us. 
These fires, they, they burn creatures alive, they destroy our homes and property, they choke the atmosphere. It's crazy. Entire towns wiped out by tornadoes and hurricanes. Lives lost, communities decimated. Yeah, I think I'd prevent that. Winds and floods and hail. Speaking of hail, whose master plan includes storms that produce giant cannonballs of ice that fall from the sky at up to 40 miles an hour? Who thinks that up? I would skip the hail chapter in my design book. Volcanoes killing tens of thousands of people at a time. Lava, heat, floods, pyroclastic flows. How many lives needlessly lost because our planet has a boiling center? The Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004 killed 225,000 people in one day. My world would not have mass drownings. 70% of the surface of this planet is uninhabitable by human beings. 99% of the water on Earth is undrinkable by human beings. I would make all of our water livable and drinkable because I could. And under the surface of those waters, I wouldn't make fish give them eyes and then make them blind. <laughs> I'm sorry. Blind creatures with eyes are like deaf creatures with ears. That kind of, I wouldn't make flightless birds and give them wings, you know. <laughs> Chickens are not the only ostrich is like this, the kiwi bird, the penguin. Why would we teach them or tease them with wings and say, sorry, you can maneuver with them, but you can't fly. I probably wouldn't do that. I would make it so that dogs live a hundred years. <laughs> I'm not worried. Cats are gods. I'm not worried about cats. I'm not. <laughs> cats are deities. They're going to live forever anyway, so I'm not worried about cats. <laughs> I wouldn't make ocean creatures that can drown. Someone explain this to me. I'm going to make you live in the ocean, but you have to surface to breathe air away from the ocean. I think that's crazy. I wouldn't build a world where animals have to eat each other alive to survive. Unbelievable cruelty. It's so not necessary. I think I could do better. I would make vegetables that taste like meat, <laughs> like meat flavored veggies. And we'd fortify them, you know, all the nutrients you find in deer and caribou, wild boar, etc. You could just bake that into the plants. It's the same great taste and texture, vitamins, proteins, without all the terror and the trauma and the shredding and the eating of your food alive. And this could work for us, too. We could actually go out, we could plant like meat seeds, and then, you know, one night we're in the mood for prime rib, a rack of lamb. Honey, I'm going to the garden. I'm going to go and harvest out the meat. <laughs> Meat, right? Rack of lamb, that sounds good. I'm going to go pick that. It's ripe and ready. I, that sounds like a pretty good deal. Here's an intense slide that's going to show a worm that lives in the human eye. You can look away if you'd like. Just take a second. This is the loa loa worm. It is a parasite that lives inside human eyeballs. I would skip loa loa day on the design. I would not conjure parasitic mushrooms. This is the cordycepsis. It's also known as the zombie mushroom. Here's how this little piece of design works. They infect ant brains, and they eat out their insides, and then they grow out of the top of the ant skull. The mushroom releases spores out into the air that then connect to other unsuspecting ants, goes in, eats out the brain, grows out of their skulls. Who thinks that shit? Oh. Check out the antenna on this snail. That, those are not antenna. That's a parasitic flatworm. It's called the green banded brood sac. It has taken over the stalk of the snail. And it flashes a bunch of colors to make the snail's head look like a caterpillar. And here's this in motion. Okay? Now, predator birds fly overhead. This gets their attention. They swoop down, eat the snail. 
the parasite releases its eggs into the bird droppings so they can hatch and infect other snails. I would skip snail parasite antenna day in my, <laughs> this is probably flatworms altogether, I think I'd skip. A few more. Did you know that the giraffe has a laryngeal nerve connecting the brain and the larynx? Has to go 12, 15 inches. Does it go 12 or 15 inches? It does not. That laryngeal nerve goes all the way down the neck and it wraps around the heart and it goes all the way back up to the larynx to the tune of 12 to 15 feet. Evolutionarily, as we saw giraffes evolving over time from other creatures, we see that this makes sense. It's, but it's not design, it's certainly not intelligent design. I would do away with mass extinction events. Scientists have said that over the course of human, over the course of world history, we've had so many mass extinction events. I, I, right now, 15,000 species are on the brink of extinction. Most of the animals, the species of animals, insects, etc., that have ever existed, died before we had the chance to properly categorize them. 99.9% .9 of all species of plants and animals that ever lived are now extinct. Who would build endangerment and extinction into their plan? Now, as I near the finish of my presentation, and hopefully you all are having a good time here, here's where the ID crowd brings out their big guns, right? The PhDs, the apologists. In this country, they are almost all Bible believers, and they're almost all pitching the Christian designer. And they explain that, well, for all the bad stuff, God's off the hook. The inefficient, the bizarre, the horrifying, these things exist because thousands of years ago, a couple of cosmically conjured garden nudists chatted up a talking snake and then committed a rebellious act of fruit munching, which angered the designer so much that he said, fuck it, I'm going to give the whole thing over to my arch nemesis. I'm going to hand the blueprints over. You take over. Fine. And then the rest of us who were wondering what's going on, we look up at the clouds, at the skies, the cosmos, for a sign, something Please, designer, maker, give us some piece of information. Let us go know what's going on, and what do we we get? Something along those lines, <laughs> right? You get that? <laughs> the bad stuff is our fault. We cheated in God's game, so the designer got mad. He took his ball and he went home. Beyond that, for some reason, God took the awful, evil, nasty, horrible devil who comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, and he gave him direct access to his very vulnerable human children and blamed the children for all the trouble. Matt Delahunty likes to say it like this. He said, God creates imperfect creatures, and then he judges them for acting imperfectly. It's crazy. It's the equivalent of throwing a live hand grenade into a nursery and blaming the babies when it explodes. It makes no sense. And then there's the Mother Teresa argument that suffering builds character. Intelligent design has a built-in allowance because against those great evils, that's when the Lord can do his great good. It's more than just a rationalization. I think this is just straight up offensive, right? The designer proves his love and his goodness and power through third degree burns and flash floods and war and domestic abuse and child leukemia and rape. Yeah, it's crazy. This is the late apologist Norman Geisler. He promoted a version of this claim. Isaiah 45 7 says this, Yahweh himself created evil. Right? I form the light and create the darkness. I'm paraphrasing. He requires evil, bad stuff, imperfection, implosion, calamity, chaos. Why? So then he can contrast all that horrible stuff with his goodness. God sets our house on fire so he can show up with a fire hose. This is John Loftus. He published a book in 2021. It's called The Problem, or it's called God and Horrendous Suffering. 
And it really dismantles this idea that all the suffering in the world is necessary and part of a, a master planner's scheme, that it makes any logical sense, moral sense. He just breaks it down so well, all right? There's no scenario where horrendous suffering makes sense. There's no reason humanity should constantly, perpetually get kicked in the balls, okay. <laughs> And if you will excuse my extremely awkward segue back to the original theme I started with, okay, I want to do this slide. I'm going to come full circle back to my original complaint letter to the manager. I want to get technical about the testicle. <laughs> Most of us know why the hum human sperm production system is housed outside the body. Our main body temperature is too hot. So to achieve the necessary three degree drop, the testes are kept separately in a pouch, which is called the scrotum, uh, also known as the scrotal sac. Another medical term for it is the wrinkled purse. <laughs> Now, the intelligent designer thought it would be a wonderful idea to load this bag up with uber-sensitive pain veins and put it in a place that's super easy to kick. <laughs> What's that about? How does that make any sense? Other animals got a better deal on this. How about the frog? Frog testes are protected way up inside the core of their bodies. I like the sound of that. Check this out. Rats, mice, hares, guinea pigs, they can make their testicles external when it's time to reproduce, but when the testicles are not needed for sperm production, they can retract them <laughs> up in, into their bodies. Retractable balls? Oh, I want that. I want retractable balls. <laughs> At the very least, if I was the designer and I was certain that human testicles needed to be external, I would give them the s I would give them the same protections that we give the heart and the lungs. Okay? Rib cage? Ball cage. I think that makes a lot of sense. Now here, if I may, I'm going to say something that the ID crowd is going to call arrogant. I, I don't think it's arrogant at all. I think it's revealing. And I think it's wonderful. You know, before we knew what germs were, billions and billions died from infectious diseases. 150 years ago, like a snap of a finger, freaking yesterday, as far as human history is concerned, nobody knew where diseases like influenza, smallpox, cholera, etc. came from. They had no idea. Nobody showed up to tell us. Jesus never in the Bible told us to wash our hands. Imagine if one of the commandments had been wash your hands. Right? Imagine how many lives would have been saved. But we didn't have that info. We had to figure it out on our own as best we could. So we intelligently designed disinfectants, filters, vaccines. We were born without the ability to fly. And so what we end up doing, we made our own wings. And recently, an even cooler example comes from this guy. This is Eve Rossi. Have you seen videos of this guy? They call him the Jet Man. He developed a personal wing suit. It's jet powered. So he jumps out of a chopper, and then he activates the jet, and he can fly for like 20, 30 minutes like a bird. It's actually really more like a jet. He's hauling ass. It's amazing, right? He didn't have wings. So he designed it. I already mentioned how some other animals can regrow amputated limbs when we can't. There's a website. It's an older site, but I still like it. And it asks the uh, legitimate question about why we report, hear reports of people going to healing services or whatever and being healed. You ever notice that they never have an amputated limb regrown? Right? It's always something kind of vague or, 
or uh, maybe it's an actor, you know, Oral Roberts and others, they had like actors who would travel around in the bus and the semis and they would go out and act like they were, they were healed from whatever. But we've never once documented ever, ever, ever somebody regrowing an amputated limb. Why won't God heal amputees? What does this say about the reality of a, what, a loving God? This is a Daniel Omar of Sudan. He lost both arms when his village was bombed. Humanitarians, inventors, innovators, scientists, they are now free, open sourcing, and 3D printing new limbs for da Daniel and people just like him all around the world. Solutions didn't come down from on high from our intelligent designer, so people intelligently designed it instead. We've seen another active spring storm season in much of the country, and where I'm at, we had a crazy tornado season. This is the famous EF5 in Moore, Oklahoma, back in 2013. 25 people dead, $2 billion in damage, including the destruction of two elementary schools. The design of our world didn't have even a warning system. We had no safe rooms, we had no options. So what did we have to do? We invented meteorology to warn the hundreds of thousands, to give them at least some short notice to take shelter. Imagine if they'd had no warnings. 14 miles of this, can you even imagine how many deaths there would have been had we not had satellite tracking, and meteorological science developed by human designers. We had days of watches and warnings, and we even designed the shelters that can withstand 200 plus mile an hour winds. What else could we do? What are the options? We'd sit there and die in the twister on a planet allegedly designed with us in mind? No, we had to intervene on our own behalf. Ear damage as a child caused my father to be deaf for most of his life. And oh, the Christians prayed for him. And this is the most Christian guy, the, the deepest, most fervent and sincere believer I ever knew. He passed away a few years ago. But uh, he lost his hearing. And so he wore hearing aids. And he stopped going to churches. Because when he would go in, especially in the Assembly of God churches, which was my mom's faith, someone would see his hearing aid and they would say, come forward, we're going to pray for you, we're going to pray divine healing for you, God wants you whole, we're going to speak the words of hearing into your body. And everybody comes around, dear Lord, we ask, dear Lord, we pray. And he would leave deaf and devastated. It was the design of cochlear implants that finally opened up his ears to the world. He discovered hearing thanks to the innovators and designer, designers of science who were interestingly human designers. Languages diverged. We designed translators. Have you guys seen those freaking Google earpieces and the apps where if you're in a foreign country and don't speak the language, you can now just say something and have a conversation as it translates in real time? Crazy. It's a babel fish for our phones. I think it's wonderful. Oceans separated us. We invented technology to connect them be a communication in real time and be a transportation physically. A distance of 70 miles used to be a 17 hour walk. Now we can drive it in an hour or less. 200 years ago, tooth abscesses were the leading cause of death. We developed and designed life-saving dentistry. Books used to have to be copied by hand. Who invented the printing press? Today, we can one-click an entire library on our phones. It's amazing. Water sources carry disease and toxins. We said, okay, fine. We need water filters. And so we intelligently designed the purifiers. Light, well, it used to require candles or the sun, torches, the designers, the human designers, invented bulbs that harnessed literal lightning to illuminate our lives. Genetic code was a mystery. We are unlocking and better understanding the genome on our own. 
in human history, how many hundreds of billions of people have seen their world with eyes that wouldn't focus? They should have seen what was on the left, but instead they were faced with what was on the right. There was no built-in solution until we designed glasses, contacts, corrective surgeries, LASIK, etc. Imperfect. But better, at least it's a solution and something. And we didn't come up with this stuff because we're playing God. We were scrambling to fix problems that shouldn't have existed in the first place. We're not designers of divinity, really. In most cases, we're designers of necessity. And obviously, the apologists agree. Okay. <laughs> Now, Stephen doesn't wear glasses, but I didn't want him to feel left out, so I superimposed, I photoshopped some glasses on Stephen Meyer. Okay. They have embraced the human designs, fixing their God's intelligent design, hashtag irony. And I give more credit to these guys than I think they may give themselves. I'll bet all four of these intelligent design proponents and campaigners could quickly come up with other improvements that we haven't mentioned today. Not out of ego, not because uh, you know they're uh, arrogant or want to be gods, it's because there's nobody else freaking doing it. It's not even a choice for the sake of safety, for protection, for well-being, for the advancement of our species and others. I encourage them to go out and make their own lists of design improvements. I would encourage them to be agents of curiosity and challenge and honesty and improvement for humans by humans. They've got the creativity. They've got the working minds. They've got the opportunity, but would they have the integrity, the honesty, the desire, the will, and perhaps the better question, do they have the balls? <laughs> Thank you all very much for having me today. Appreciate you so very much. <laughs>